So with that, I'd like to introduce our morning keynote speaker, John Friedman, who will help us understand what the meaning of social and economic mobility means at a hyper-local level. John is a professor of economics and international affairs at, and public policy at Brown University and a founding co-director of Opportunity Insights at Harvard University. His research brings together theory and data, harnessing the power of large administrative data sets to yield policy relevant insights on a wide range of topics, including taxation, healthcare, and education quality. His work has appeared in top academic journals as well as in major media outlets. His most well-known papers estimate the long-term effect of teachers on student outcomes, such as college attendance and earnings. In just one year, his research shows a great teacher can raise the lifetime earnings of a single class of students by nearly 1.5 million. This work was cited by President Obama in his 2012 State of the Union address. Dr. Friedman has also worked as a special assistant to the President for Economic Policy at the National Economic Council in the White House from 2013 to 2014. He holds a PhD in economics, a master's in statistics, and a bachelor's in economics, all from Harvard University. And he is a research associate, associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Please join me in welcoming John Friedman. Thank you so much, uh, Samantha, for that uh, warm introduction. It's really wonderful to uh, be here with you all this morning. Uh, what I want to talk about is upward mobility and uh, what we can do, what we can learn from big data to improve it. And to motivate uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I think just, you know, we all know this is a problem, but just to give you a sense of uh, the magnitude of this problem, I just want to start out with a, um, a very simple uh, graph. And uh, what this graph does uh, is do our best to uh, put a number on the American dream. So specifically what we do is take children born in each year since 1940. And then we see what their standard of living is when they grow up and are in their 30s and 40s. And we compare that to the standard of living of uh, their parents when they were in their 30s and 40s, a generation earlier, and just ask for what fraction of children have living standards improved one generation to the next. What you see here is if you look at the uh, left side of this figure, for children born in the 1940s, it was a near guarantee to achieve the American dream by this definition. Upward mobility and uh, growth in living standards over generations was so strong that people talked about doubling standards of living, in fact, as, as the goal. Because as you see, basically everybody was at least meeting the standard of living uh, of their parents. Now, over the past half century, what we've seen is the fraction of children achieving this measure of the American dream has fallen such that by the time I was born in 1980, it's literally no better than a coin flip, whether a child will grow up to have a higher standard of living than uh, his or her parents. And I think that this is, of course, just one way to present what's been going on, but I think that this fact really lies at the heart of not only a lot of the policy challenges that we face today, but a lot of the underlying discontent with uh, what's been going on. And I think figuring out why this has been happening and what we can do to reverse this trend is simply one of the seminal policy challenges of this generation. And that's what my colleagues and I have really dedicated our work to. Now, uh, how do we go about trying to make progress on this uh, enormous question? Well, we kind of do the only thing that uh, we know how to do, which is just to try to break down the problem using data. And in this particular context, uh, we're going to use data that is uh, really amazing. Uh, we can call it big data if we want a kind of a catchy phrase. 
And that's going to allow us to really understand this problem not only at the type of national level that I just showed you, but to really get down to a much more granular understanding of where and for whom opportunity exists in the United States. And then that's going to help motivate the type of policy solutions that probably aren't going to solve this problem, but I think are a good way to make some, uh, some headway. And that's what I want to talk about today. So the starting point for this is that we're just going to look across the United States and see how upward mobility varies uh, just looking from city to city. So that's uh, this map. It's a heat map. So uh, blue means higher upward mobility. Red means lower upward mobility. What precisely am I showing you? What we're doing is we're looking at children who were born to poor families, uh, specifically families who were making an average of about $25,000 a year when uh, the kids were growing up. Uh, and that's the same in all these different places. And we're asking how do children born in these locations fare when they themselves grow up and get into the labor force into their 30s. Each little polygon that you see on this particular map is a city. And again, just to, to reemphasize the point, we connect children to where they were born and spent their childhood, not necessarily where they are today. So if a child was born in Pittsburgh, grew up in Pittsburgh, whether they're living today as an adult still in Pittsburgh, or they're living in New York, or they're living in Omaha, Nebraska, wherever it is, we kind of trace them back to Pittsburgh. And the reason that uh, we do that is that we're really focused on the childhood roots of upward mobility. And you'll see in a little bit why I think that's the right approach to this problem. So what do we see from looking at this map? Well, I think the, the striking fact is just the enormous variation in outcomes for kids born to what seem like pretty similar families. So just to give you uh, kind of a, a very sharp contrast, down in the southeast, a child born to a poor family in Charlotte, on average, essentially has no increase in their standard of living. On average, those children will grow up to earn about the same $25,000 that uh, their parents earned. In contrast, if you look in Dubuque, Iowa, in the, um, I don't know if I, uh, yeah, right there, in the upper um, Midwest, there, children born to those same poor families are earning nearly double, almost $50,000 when they grow up. And of course, those are just two endpoints of a great deal of variety. So Pittsburgh, um, is about 34,000 right there. You see it's this kind of light green color, so it's kind of slightly better than average nationally. And you can see uh, some of the other uh, cities that I've put on the map. Now, of course, the next question after just documenting that this great variation exists is we want to know why it exists. Maybe we can learn something from what's going on in some places um, and not going on in other places. And so the first thing we actually looked into, uh, and this is something that I know uh, Jay and others talked about yesterday, is economic growth, right? And the first thing, you know, we talk to any mayor, the first thing uh, that they're focused on is jobs. And I don't think it's a crazy idea that if you are born and grow up in a place which is economically booming, there are lots of jobs, you just are more likely to have a, a high paying job yourself. Uh, for instance, one of the highest uh, upward mobility areas of the country is Western North Dakota, where they've uh, been um, recently pumping a lot of oil. So what we did is we took the 30 largest metro areas in the country and just asked, how does the upward mobility, as, as measured by this particular outcome, compare to job growth over the period when these kids are growing up? And so this is a, a scatter plot showing that relationship. You see where Pittsburgh is. There's just no relationship, literally uncorrelated. So how can this be the case? How can it be that economic growth has so little connection 
when comparing across cities to the upward mobility for children, well, I think a place like Charlotte actually provides a really great intuition for what's going on there. So you see Charlotte and Atlanta is another city down in the lower right of this graph. Booming economic cities, enormous job growth over this period. It's not just that jobs were being created, high paying jobs were being created, economic engines of the southeast, but kids growing up in those cities from poor families have very low outcomes. So what's going on here? When those jobs have been created in Charlotte and Atlanta, they've not been going to children from poor families in those communities. Those children, for whatever reason, we're gonna to try to dig into that later on, they are not in a position to take those jobs. And instead, they go to people who move into these cities. And so what you've seen, instead of upward mobility for uh, local children, what you've seen is tremendous in-migration of very uh, both high-scale, low-scale, lots of different types of workers coming to these places and taking lots of these new jobs. Right? If we had a, a room like this in Charlotte and I asked how many people were born and raised here, I'm guessing I'd get 20%, 20% of hands. Now, just to be clear, like, the fact that Charlotte and Atlanta have been economically growing and have all this influx of these highly talented workers is probably a great thing. And so I don't want to say anything that like economic growth is a bad thing. I just think it's important to recognize that these data show that it is just a different thing than providing a pathway for upward mobility for children born into poor families. And kind of to, to preview what I think the data are going to say, like why is it that kids in Charlotte and Atlanta aren't prepared to take those jobs, I think it it's going to depend less on just the raw availability of jobs and more on their social and human capital development, basically asking are you putting those children in a position where they are able to take these good jobs uh, here or elsewhere. So let me go back to the map. Um, Economic growth doesn't seem to help explain what is blue and what is red, so uh, what else could be going on? Another very important factor is race. So you can see there's kind of much uh, redder outcomes in uh, especially the southeast and other parts of the country uh, where especially the fraction of the population that are black is higher. And we then kind of examine this in more detail in the data. A simple way to do this is just to recreate this map focusing separately on white children and black children. And we're gonna keep the family income the same. So we're gonna still be comparing kids who grew up in these kind of $25,000 families across all these different cities, but we're just gonna look at uh, white and black children separately. So let me start with white and black boys. Here are two maps. We have uh, black boys on the left, white boys on the right. Now. I think your initial instinct here is gonna be that I've uh, made it somewhat difficult for you to compare what's going on because I've plotted these two maps on two different scales. Unfortunately, they are not on two different scales. This is the same scale, which you see on the bottom here. And what you see is that there is almost no city in America where black children from these types of families have higher outcomes anywhere than some of the lowest average outcomes across all these different cities for white boys. So just very stark differences. Even comparing children who grew up in the same city, it's not shown here. You can even dive deeper. You can compare children who grew up on the same block and you essentially still get these differences. Black boys have considerably uh, lower earnings, higher incar incarceration rates, holding almost everything you can measure fixed. This is not the case, actually, for black women. So if we redo these kind of paired maps looking at, uh, on the left, black women, and on the right, white women, here, it's not always the, the case that the same places that provide opportunity for one group also provides it for the other, but on average, these two groups look actually pretty similar. 
And so what should you take away from this? It seems like race is a, a strong determinant of differences in mobility, but driven through the outcomes of boys. It doesn't really seem to be occurring for, for girls. And so uh, that, that's all I'm going to say on race data. There's a, a lot more work trying to figure out like why exactly this is going on and, and all that, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about um, in the question period. So let me go back again to the map. So we know that race is partly driving what's going on, but we saw that there were still enormous differences between cities, even when looking at children only from uh, a single race. So what is it that exactly uh, makes outcomes so different in some cities than others? And to try to answer that, I'm going to dive down even deeper and look not just what's going on between cities, but actually look at what's going on between neighborhoods within cities. And so to do that, just come over here for a second, I'm going to uh, use a, uh, a web tool that we've developed in partnership with the U.S. Census Bureau called the Opportunity Atlas. Uh, and let me flip over to this uh, right now. What you see here, just to start with, is, is uh, just the same national map uh, that I showed you on the slides. This is a website online, opportunityatlas.org, uh, publicly available. Um, and so uh, please do check it out. And so what we're going to do is now we're going to zoom into Pittsburgh. Uh, and what you'll see in Pittsburgh, which I think is just so striking, is that we actually, you know, I haven't changed the scale on the map. You see the same variation in opportunity from very low opportunity deep red areas to very high opportunity deep blue areas, all within, not even the Pittsburgh area, all within like literally the city limits of Pittsburgh, right? You know, we could go in five miles in one direction from where we're sitting and find extremely high opportunity neighborhoods, extremely low opportunity neighborhoods, and such that in some places, literally children who grow up a quarter mile one way as opposed to another way have just dramatically diverging outcomes uh, as adults. So let me just kind of show you a few things um, that you can do on this map. So, you know, first of all, uh, even within Pittsburgh, uh, right, there's going to be some variation. So here, again, just to like hold some things fixed, I'm focusing on children from white families. We could do the same thing, focusing, oh, Mouse is a little bit uh, sticky here. Uh, we could do the same thing focusing on children um, from black families. Again, you get the same dramatic contrast in colors uh, between different locations. Note that there are many uh, neighborhoods here that are grayed out. That's simply reflecting uh, racial segregation in uh, 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 neighborhoods. There are simply not enough black children who grow up in a number of these neighborhoods to produce an estimate. You know, that's something that you see not only in Pittsburgh, you see that in almost every uh, city in the country. Um, we can look not only at income as an outcome of interest, uh, but for instance, especially when we um, focus the map on uh, boys, we can look at incarceration rates as an outcome. And I think uh, that's something, especially for black men, that plays a very large role in their relatively low rates of upward mobility. Just to give you a sense of the magnitudes here, um, some of these deep red neighborhoods, uh, uh, like here just south of the river, 37% incarceration rate. And again, I just want to like, this is not 37% over a lifetime. This is not 37% in a year. This is 37% of uh, children born in this neighborhood specifically poor black uh, boys born in this neighborhood, were incarcerated on a single day in 2010 when they conducted the 2010 census. So like this fraction of those children were in jail on April 1st, 2010. Just shockingly high rates. And again, you see this in almost every city across the country. Uh, let me go back to um, now just focus on um, everyone, and I want to show you one more thing. So this uh, plots the outcomes for poor children, but in all neighborhoods in the city and beyond. And of course, some of these neighborhoods are low income, some of them are middle income, some of them are very wealthy neighborhoods. 
And so there are still a few poor families living in the very wealthy neighborhoods, but maybe we don't want to compare them. Maybe it's just like a little bit of a um, kind of a weird group of people. And so what we can do is um, look at median rents. So here, uh, the darker uh, blue areas are the higher rent places. This is going to be familiar to you, but what I think is in, in particular very valuable is we can uh, filter the map to include only places with uh, rental prices less than about $1,000. Why did I pick that? It's about what the housing voucher standard are. So think about this as a kind of a representative set of neighborhoods where a family on a local housing voucher would be able to afford an apartment. So now let's go back to the, uh, the opportunity map. And what you can see is that we've taken some of the blue higher opportunity areas off the map, but a bunch of them still remain. And so I'm going to come back to this later. What you see in Pittsburgh and in many, many other cities is that there are places which are both relatively affordable and provide a quite high level of upward mobility, as we see in, measured in the data, for poor children who grew up in those places. And so I think those are the places that we really want to learn from. Those are the places that uh, I think provide the most promise for telling us what exactly seems to be going right, what can we learn from those places to take uh, to other places. So let me go back to the map here. And you know, I've shown you a bunch of variation, but I still really haven't started to answer the question of why it is that these places are different. And so I am actually going to start by uh, doing what I think uh, is incredibly helpful and just listening to what people say when you ask them what is going on in high opportunity neighborhoods. And we were incredibly fortunate that an NPR reporter named Jasmine Garsdy did exactly this in a pair of neighborhoods that are extremely close together, one high opportunity, one low opportunity in Brooklyn, New York. And so I'm just actually going to play you a snippet of part of her reporting to give you a sense for when she actually just went and talked to these families on the ground, uh, what did they say? When people find out where Audra Palacio is from, they often react in disbelief. Well, how, how could you come from there and you live there? And it's like, almost as if it's like, I can't believe you made it out. Nearly 40% of Brownsville lives in poverty. And if you look at the Opportunity Atlas and zoom into Brownsville, a lot of it is exactly what you'd expect. Black kids raised in the area 30 some years ago now make about $17,000 a year, same as their parents. But once you head across Dumont Avenue, everything changes. Black kids from the same exact background are doing better than their parents, making around $26,000 a year. So that's what you see in the Opportunity Atlas in this particular section of Brooklyn. Now let's hear about what the families say about what's going on. In the 80s, New York City had been hard hit by a recession. Then the crack and HIV epidemics. There was a part of Brownsville that was totally abandoned, the other side of Dumont. The New York City government sold over 16 square blocks of Brownsville to the East Brooklyn congregations for one dollar. Those blocks were dilapidated, run down. The city agreed to build infrastructure and provide cash subsidies for over a thousand affordable homes. They would start selling at $30,000 each. They were called Nehemiah houses, after the man in the Bible who rebuilt parts of Jerusalem. The family was growing and we needed something that was much better for the children. I didn't like elevators, up and down the elevators for my children, because it was a lot of people living in the housing projects. Audra Palacio was six when they bought the house. I remember when we moved into the Nehemiahs. We were so excited. We had rooms, we had space, we had our backyard. Here's Reverend Brawley. He says the Nehemiah houses in Brooklyn gave children a space to do homework, a good night's sleep. When people have ownership of their properties, ownership of their community, you have a better chance of addressing all core issues, such as education and quality of life. After I leave the family, I walk just a few blocks to Dumont Avenue. According to the Atlas, it's the dividing line. 
on the map, it looks jarring, but in person, it's completely unspectacular. People bustle on their way to work, cars zoom by. Just another New York City street, it means nothing. But what side you're on means everything. Jasmine Gars, NPR News, New York. So right, if you listen to what the residents of the Nehemiah houses talk about, kind of exactly you start to hear these themes where it's not like the Nehemiah houses provided great access to jobs. It's about the community that was enabled there. And it's also critically, the, of course it's about the people and the community, but it really is something about the physical space in that community. Right, it's, it's very clear that even though some of those very same people were living on the other side of Dumont Avenue, uh, they were not as able, they didn't feel like they could have uh, that same ability to, to put their kids on the right trajectory as when they literally, in this case, moved across the street. And so building on that, what I wanna do now is try to think about, you know, can we see evidence in the data of a bunch of these different aspects of what Audra Palacio and the Reverend were saying in that particular context. Like how, how generalizable is, uh, is that example? And so to do that, uh, we've tried to look at not just children who moved between these two neighborhoods, but all children who moved across neighborhoods when they were growing up. I'm gonna present to you kind of in the vignette of moving from uh, Brownsville to the EMI houses just to give you a sense of what we're doing, but uh, we're, we're really looking at all children who move as they're growing up to try to understand what happens uh, when you move. So I've uh, drawn these uh, horizontal lines here to give you the two benchmarks which uh, we showed in, in the atlas, right? It, for children who spent their entire lives in Brownsville, they would grow up to earn about $17,000. For children who spent their entire lives living in the Nehemiah houses, they would grow up to earn about uh, $26,000. So the key question here is what happens when children are born in, the, in Brownsville and then move at some point to the Nehemiah houses? So let's just start with a single example. What happens when families move at age two? What are the outcomes of children in that context? Well, it turns out uh, they're very close to the children who spent their entire lives living in the Nehemiah houses. They earn about 25,500, something like that. Now, as children get older at the age of the move, what happens? You see outcomes start to decline down towards the outcomes in Brownsville. So what's, what, are, what is this chart saying? The later is the age of the move, so that's the longer you spend in Brownsville, the less time that you get to grow up in the Nehemiah houses, the more your outcomes look like the outcomes of kids who spend their entire childhood in uh, Brownsville. And in fact, by the time you get to age 23 or so, you've basically converged. And then you can even look after 23 what happens, basically uh, things stay the same. So I think there are three important general lessons to take from this chart. The first thing is that this really suggests that we are learning something about the causal effect of neighborhoods as opposed to just what types of people live in what types of places. It's not just that a different set of families live in the Nehemiah houses than in Brownsville. There's actually something about the Nehemiah houses that helps a given family have better outcomes for their kids. The second thing is this very gradual slope. One way to think about the slope is it's telling you something about what ages it's very important to live in a good community that's gonna support upward mobility. If all that mattered was your environment before age five, and then kind of things were set after that, you'd find that it wouldn't matter where you lived after age five. But in fact, what we see is that each year that goes by seems to be the same opportunity to slightly nudge children towards a better trajectory or a chance where they might fall a little bit more onto a worse trajectory. It almost looks just kind of like a straight dose response model where kind of like each year, it's like whatever neighborhood you're in, and you just kind of add that up. And of course, it's probably a lot more complicated than that on the ground, but I, I think that actually provides like a reasonable kind of first baseline of, of how this stuff works. 
It's kind of basically about, you know, each year that goes by, doesn't matter whether you're young or whether in your teenage years, or, uh, each year kind of provides that same opportunity to, um, to, to course correct. There's no sense here where there's one kind of magic bullet age where if only we can fix things at age X, then things will be set. Third, I just want to, again, reinforce the fact that we see these large changes, right, 50% increase in uh, earnings in adulthood from literally moving across the street. And of course, not all cities will have something literally across the street, but almost all cities have this type of thing uh, within a few miles. And so I think this emphasizes the extent to which local solutions can really be part of the policy process. Right? We don't have to look to what's going on in Dubuque in order to start to understand what we might be able to do to improve things in Charlotte. And I think that's a really good thing because I've tried suggesting looking at Dubuque to the mayor of Charlotte and he kind of looked at me a little bit funny and I, it was pretty clear he didn't think that was like a super productive suggestion because of course you know, Char you know, Charlotte and Dubuque are very different in, in many, many ways. But being able to look in his own city and saying, well, if things are working here, if things aren't working here, like, yes, of course, those neighborhoods are a little bit different, but it's really all the same area, I think, provides a great footing to start. So this suggests that when people move, it can make a difference. What about policy? You know, can just can start by thinking about, like, we are not going to be able to move everybody, but we do spend quite a bit of money thinking about housing vouchers, spending money on affordable housing projects. All these policies often explicitly have the aim of helping families move to opportunity. And so I'm going to show you the results of uh, two different studies which have tried to, to, to examine how policies that help families move in one way or another kind of interact with what's going on here. And so the first set of policies I'm going to talk about are uh, a set of experiments that were implemented in the mid-1990s called the Moving to Opportunity Experiments. So uh, many of you may be familiar with that, but uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, what happened was that in five cities uh, nationwide, families were offered different types of housing vouchers to move out of these kind of traditional, very high concentrated poverty public housing uh, towers. So just to give you an example, Chicago was one of the five cities. The other five cities were uh, Baltimore, Boston, New York, and LA. So in Chicago, uh, the families uh, mostly started in these three uh, public housing projects. And then uh, as part of this randomized design, families were offered one of three different set of supports. So if you were in the control group, you basically just received some cash and that was it. And most of those families ended up staying in or quite nearby these um, public housing, uh, kind of initial public housing um, uh, developments. There was then a second group that received a traditional Section 8 voucher where they right, received uh, a subsidy that they could go rent from any um, private market apartment um, they could find. Uh, those families tended to move to uh, neighborhoods that I've uh, denoted on this map uh, with a triangle, so that's like Oakland, Washington Park, and Grand Crossing. Those neighborhoods tended to be still pretty close to the, uh, the old neighborhoods where they started. Finally, there were some families that were offered uh, what they called the experimental voucher. And the key idea here was to try to get them to move not just to these locations that were very nearby, but to try to get them to move to a lower poverty neighborhood. And so you actually were not allowed to use the voucher unless you moved to a neighborhood um, that had uh, less than a 10% poverty rate. And so those families moved a little bit further south uh, to areas like Calumet Heights and Riverdale. Uh, what happened, right? And so if you kind of look at how this comes out on the atlas, um, the control sites are lower opportunity than the Section 8 sites, are lower, opportun sorry, are, are lower opportunity, again, than the experimental sites, but still, if you look at the experimental sites, they're still not great, and I'll come back to that in a second. But it, we did, th th there are better neighborhoods as you kind of go up through these, these uh, uh, sections. So, so what happened? Well, a lot of the initial focus from Moving to Opportunity looked at the adults, and what has now become a robust, you know, 25-year literature has basically found nothing for the adults. So for instance, these are just the um, individual earnings for these families that received these three different types of vouchers. 
you see really no uh, significant differences between them. And you know, if you kind of actually look at the exact numbers, families in this experimental voucher group actually earn the lowest. What happens if you look at the kids, though? Well, when you look at the kids, and especially the kids who are under 13, right? why do you need to look at the kids under 13? Well, if we have an exposure model, you actually have to be living in that new neighborhood for a little while in order to be exposed to its beneficial effects. Kids who moved at these younger ages, we see steady gains on the left in earnings. They're earning about 30% more if they were in the experimental group and lived in those neighborhoods than in the control group and lived in the original neighborhoods. Uh, here's college attendance rates, uh, again, going up by about 30% from one group to the next. And so uh, I think what this new evaluation of uh, moving to opportunity suggests is that when families are able to move to these higher opportunity neighborhoods, in fact, they do actually seem to have their kids do better. But what was the problem here? Well, just returning to the map, right, there were the original sites, here were the new sites. We're still all kind of in a not great space, right? Now, some of the blue over on the left, for those of you who know Chicago, are some fairly um, you know, affluent and expensive suburbs, but a bunch of them are actually quite affordable places. There are a bunch of these blue places which actually have pretty sizable um, minority communities to the extent that that's a constraint. We don't want to just having families moving to, to all white neighborhoods. Um, and so I think the question that comes out of here is, you know, why is it that uh, it, these families, you know, at least for instance in the triangles, they were given their choice. They could have lived anywhere and they chose to live in these what are relatively low opportunity places that are quite nearby to where they started. So why are these families making that choice? Well, one story is that, you know, just that's where they really want to live. And maybe it's lower opportunity, but maybe it's also closer to their friends and family. It's closer to where they work. It's a neighborhood that has just generally more support for uh, these families and the particular needs that they have. Maybe these communities, all things considered, really just are the places that these families want to live in. Another hypothesis, though, is that there are barriers and constraints that prevent these families from either knowing about or being able to execute on a move to some of these higher opportunity places. And so to try to disentangle that, and also to try to see whether we could get families moving not just to these slightly less red neighborhoods, but actually to some of the blue neighborhoods, uh, our team cooperated with the Seattle and King County Housing Authorities over the past few years to run a program called Creating Moves to Opportunity. And that's the first specific policy uh, avenue that I'm going to discuss that I think comes right out of these data, right? If there are these very high opportunity places, we spend a lot of money trying to move people, or allowing people to move around, what if we help them move to these higher opportunity places? Is that something that would work? And so in this particular case, what happened was we took people who had applied for the standard housing voucher, and uh, they had to opt into this study, but when they opted into the study, uh, some of them were randomized to receive three different, together, but three different sets of supports. One support was customized search assistance. Think of this as uh, about five hours with a, a rental broker who would sit down and talk with the families about what type of unit they were looking for, what were their constraints, tell them about some of these different characteristics of neighborhoods, about the kids' opportunities, about other features, and just help them locate an apartment. Second, we help pull some landlords in in these higher opportunity areas, primarily by kind of sweeping away some of the red tape that's associated with getting apartments into the program. So uh, one example is that it sometimes takes quite a while to start getting paid from a Section 8 tenant, just because it takes a few months for the payments to go through. You know, if you're a small time landlord, you know, that can be a problem from a liquidity perspective. And then the third thing is uh, we provided some short-term financial assistance to the families who were moving. Uh, on average, it was about $1,000 to help pay off old bills or help pay for moving expenses, down payment, that type of thing. In all, this cost about $2,600 per family. Now, that's a lot of money, but that's actually a very small share of the total value of the voucher, which in, you know, in this case, it's actually over $100,000. 
it's even just per year, the, the rental assistance alone is nearly $20,000, and then these families are staying in these units for, for a while. So I think as a share of the total investment here, this was not that big of a deal. What happened? Well, obviously we haven't been able to follow the kids long enough to see are they themselves having better outcomes as adults, but what we did see is just dramatic, dramatic changes in where these families choose to live. So for families that did not receive this set of supports, and generally if you look at the ways that families chose apartments before this program was around, about 14% of them chose to live in these high opportunity uh, neighborhoods. Once they had the support of the program, that number went up to 54%. So we're nearly quadrupling the share of families who are living in these places. What's more, you can go back and interview the families later on and ask kind of what do you think about this move? What do you think about this new neighborhood? Did you face any trade-offs in terms of commute times or maybe a smaller apartment in order to live in these places? And the, the news is just kind of uniformly positive. There's no evidence that people have smaller or less desirable apartments. In fact, people are more excited about the neighborhoods they're living in. They are more likely to say they want to continue to live in this neighborhood on a longer term basis. And so you know, the, the data just suggests that you know, this type of uh, intervention can really unlock the ability for these families to get access to these types of neighborhoods. We also studied what happened when uh, Seattle and King County implemented um, uh, payment reforms where they tried to uh, index the vouchers uh, a little bit better to local rent levels. Uh, that is good at getting people to live in more expensive neighborhoods, but as I've shown you before, more expensive neighborhoods often don't correlate that well with higher opportunity neighborhoods, and so you basically don't get any change in this only from going to uh, a locally based uh, payment standard. So I think this type of approach, uh, changing first of all the way that housing voucher policies work, but more generally thinking about affordable housing and how we either foster or fight against segregation is one major policy direction that we can use at a local level to increase upward mobility. So I mean, just to come back to the case of Pittsburgh and think about this more generally, so here's this map that I showed you before where I've grayed out a bunch of the areas that are, are too expensive. Now let me layer on top of this the location of local investments that benefited from the low income housing tax credit. Where did the light tech properties get located? Right, you can see it's like they've like quite carefully gone and made sure that these are not located in high opportunity neighborhoods. And you know, there are reasons that are inherent in the tax credit where you, know, you get a bigger tax credit if you live in a, if, if you locate the property in, in a higher poverty tract, which is part of this. Um, but generally, it just does not seem that thinking about where we are helping lower income families live has been a part of where these projects are cited. And I think that really should be a much larger factor uh, going forward. So we've talked about people moving, but of course, it's never going to be a solution to move everyone. First of all, not everyone's going to want to move. And then second of all, you're going to have to think about all of those people who are still living in those low income neighborhoods, even when maybe more people have the opportunity to move to higher income neighborhoods, higher opportunity neighborhoods. And so that's, I think, the second major policy direction that these data suggest, place-based investments to just lift up opportunity in a given place. And I want to be very upfront here that I think I do not have as clear a policy approach as I have in some of these uh, um, affordable housing or voucher policies, but I do think the data suggest a number of ways that help us think about the types of place-based investments that one might want to make in these neighborhoods. So how are we going to use the data to figure out what type of investments we might want to make? Well, the first thing to do is just look at what are the characteristics of high opportunity neighborhoods compared with lower opportunity neighborhoods in the same city. These are all same city comparisons. What you see are there are four factors that stand out. And the broad theme here is it's all going to be about the people and the human capital and the social capital that these neighborhoods are set up to provide children. So the first thing is that lower poverty rate neighborhoods have higher opportunity. But 
Again, that is not about just the prevalence of jobs. If you look instead at where jobs are located, even on a local level, again, it is totally uncorrelated with opportunity. What matters is what the people there are doing. Are the people there employed? Doesn't matter if they're employed across town or nearby. What matters is whether the people are employed. The second thing that matters is having stable families. So one specific thing that seems to matter a lot is the share of two-parent families in a neighborhood. But again, this is about community. It's not your own two-parent family that really matters. It's having all the other families in the neighborhood have two-parent families. That's actually what really matters. Similarly, having high degrees of social capital, lots of engagement, civic engagement and community engagement in neighborhoods, strongly correlated with upper mobility, and finally, better school quality is the, is the fourth characteristic. So again, I think taking a step back, all of these things suggest it's all about the human capital and the social capital. We want to put children on a trajectory such that they are in the position to get those jobs. It's not just about bringing the jobs there if they're not able and ready to take those jobs. The second thing we can learn from the data is what really is a neighborhood from this perspective? Should we think about developing like the west side of the city versus the east side of the city? Is it this block versus that block? Like really what, what is it that is the geographic uh, locus here that matters? The data on the Opportunity Atlas work at the tract level, not because we designed that as the optimal level at which to provide data, that's just what was possible. So I'm going to actually use this correlation with poverty rates to tease this out. You can do it with any of these other characteristics too. It's, you get the same thing. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go block by block. And I'm going to start just by asking what's the correlation between kids' opportunity and poverty rates on a given block? And kind of benchmark that to 100. That's the first dot in the upper left. Now I'll start walking away from the, the tract where the kids are located, and we'll ask, how do the kids' opportunities correlate with the poverty rate one block over, two blocks over, three blocks over, and so on? Well, by the time you get one block over, you see this correlation has already fallen to 60%. And as we continue to walk away, you'll see that this correlation falls very rapidly, such that by the time you're about a half a mile away, there's no correlation left over between what's going on in that tract over there and kids' outcomes right here. And even within a half a mile, you can see it's really what's going on within just a couple hundred yards that really matters. So this suggests just an incredibly local focus. What's going on on this really narrow set of blocks is going to help the set of children growing up on these blocks, but maybe not have such, uh, that much of a broader effect. I think this makes sense, again, fitting in this whole paradigm, if it's about the community and about the people you're interacting with, the people you're interacting with are by and large really close by. The people you interact with are also at schools, but again, it's not people who are like one school over, it's people who are like in your classroom at your school, extremely kind of local, like kind of almost like personal focus uh, seems to really be what drives this. So if you take these two facts and you combine them with that very steady effect of moving that I showed you earlier, where I think that lands us is what we like to call a life course data-driven approach to place-based change. We need to think at an extremely local level. We need to think about these factors that we talked about like community, and we need to think about supporting children, not just at one particular age or another particular age, but really all ages along the way. Of course, the types of supports you're going to want for children who are age two is going to be very different from what you're going to want for children who are age 22. But you want to make sure that you have something all along the way. Because again, every year that goes by where you're not providing that support is a year where people can, can fall off the track. Now, What's an example of how we've implemented this? We've been working with the city of Charlotte to think about how this might work in practice. And uh, what we've basically done is tried to map this type of approach against what they're already doing. So 
Turns out Charlotte had already, before we started talking to them, put a big focus on early childhood. And so, you know, of course, you know, you can make sure that it's ex extended to all the different parts of the city, which they had basically already done. That suggested that kind of more supports there weren't really what was needed. What we found was that there was actually relatively little going on in the uh, more supports for adolescent children. Uh, in Charlotte in particular, it's um, low-income uh, black boys who you really see the extremely low outcomes for. And so kind of various different aspects of social capital and mentorship for children in that age range seemed to be really what was lacking in the policy space. And so that's the type of thing uh, we've been working with them on. And of course, right, there are many different policies, many different programs, and you know, not, none of this tells you exactly what program you're going to want to plug in, uh, and that's probably going to differ from place to place, but I think it's, it, it you know, really narrows uh, the focus quite a bit. Now, the final thing uh, where I think there really is a uh, potential to have policy support upward mobility comes at the end of uh, children's uh, childhoods, which focuses on college and career readiness. And I think, again, the reason why that's so important is because someone's college or community college or, or whatever is uh, the higher educational opportunity, it's not just uh, kind of a narrow thing about training and academics, although that's also very important, it's about the broader community, right? We don't spend a lot of time very carefully trying to match children and families together in neighborhoods, but we do do that in colleges, right? We're already doing that. And so we just want to think about that process from the perspective of upward mobility. And so, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today, but um, through a different set of projects, we've uh, called the CLIMB Initiative, we've thought a lot about how individual colleges support upward mobility. So, for instance, produce data like the following for University of Pittsburgh, you can look at where students are coming from across the income distribution, and then you can look at, for each of those students, how do they do when they themselves go out into the labor force. And so that's this line here. And so at a place like Pittsburgh, and this is actually something you see at a lot of uh, kind of you know, selective high quality institutions, what you see is that uh, there are not so many kids that come from the, the lower quintiles. Each of these buckets is chosen to be a quintile, right? So if kids were coming in a representative way, then you'd have 20% of children from each bucket. Now, that's not a reasonable benchmark probably for a place like Pittsburgh, but you see this differ across universities. You can then see four kids from each quintile. How are they doing when they uh, leave school and go into the labor force? We're looking at them in their 30s. And again, you see here something that I think is more generally uh, what we see in higher education, which is that despite you know, pretty large differences in where the students are coming from, we see actually very similar outcomes for students when they get out into the labor force, no matter uh, their background. And I think that's somewhat surprising because you might have thought that the same types of advantages that the kids over here benefited from that were the reason that they were more able to get to Pittsburgh to start with, they would also continue to benefit from as they were in school, as they were leaving school, as they went into the job market. But what it really seems to happen is that uh, for these students at least, Pitt is a leveler. It's leveling the playing field uh, across these sets of students. Um, and so it can, you can think about you know, how you can do this in the community college setting, in a regional college setting. Uh, different colleges are going to face different challenges here, uh, but I think this is another powerful way to support upward mobility. So let me stop there, and I just kind of put this back up to kind of bring us full circle and remind us we have this enormous challenge in front of us, uh, but I really think that with the help of some of these new data sets and this type of precision medicine approach, we can really make great strides towards uh, reversing this trend and really making the American dream a possibility for all. So thank you so much.